Hey everybody, welcome back to... Let me get my microphone over here. <laughs> a little closer to me. Um, to uh, Julian Chambers, part two. I'm addressing some questions and answers. I started writing out answers and things for her. And I'm still going to put the answers that I wrote out there. But I think this needs to be kind of verbally done. Um, I would love to do a Zoom. But our time frames are so different that uh, she never would be there. But... To do it in front of people and around people so they can ask questions, go back and forth and stuff would be quite beneficial. But um, I'm just going to do the best I can right here in responding to some of her answers and, and her questions and responses to my video. And so uh, let's start with looking at what she said. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys can see that pretty clearly. Um, let's see. Uh, Stephen, you said those saints going to heaven 8033, which scripture states happened, was not a resurrection. I repeat, souls going to heaven is not a resurrection. Resurrection is to life, is the dead body coming back to life, hence why you're confused on the subject. So what? She goes, Matthew 27, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit, and he, she quotes that, how the dead came out of their tombs and everything else. And so here's her confusion, and this is what I pointed out. Matthew 27, 52 was a, was a resurrection. It was not the first resurrection. They were not raised to new life, eternal life, in glorified bodies. They just came back to life the same way Lazarus and everybody else did, which means exactly later on they would have died. Nobody suggested that they are the ones who somehow or another ascended into heaven or anything else like that. Never implied that. Uh, but technically, the text never says what happens to them. We don't know what happens to them. We don't know if they were maybe, were they were raised uh, glorified and they were the part of the first fruits. It, it, very possible. But we have no definitive answer on that point. Um, so both of them are very valid. Now, the idea, it doesn't talk about any type of ex ascension leads us to believe that they probably just died again but that does not rule out that so there's something that might have happened there uh when they ascended but i'm going to get, get to more of that and this is something that's uh, uh, argued a lot over the years is what did uh, jesus do for the three days that he was in hades and the scripture says that he preached the good news to those um that were in hades and set them free now Theologically, okay, let me explain this too. Let me just do this as a background. You have Catholic doctrine. You have um, Jewish doctrine, of course, and theology. You have Mormon theology. You have all types of different th theologies. Um, Reformed theology. You have Calvinists, Arminian. Those are different branches of theology. If you've never studied that branch, you're not going to know really the fine points of what they teach. You just don't. And the real issue is, I am coming from an evangelical, traditional, Pentecostal, theological background, not necessarily Reformed, yet there's a lot of agreements in there, uh, but from the Pentecostal views of theology that holds to a lot of the traditions of theology over the Catholic Church over the 2,000 years, with minor agreements and disagreements and things like this that go all the way through there. But again, um, I have studied Catholic theology. I don't know it very well in, in, in some regards. So I'm not an expert on Catholic theology. Um, if you don't study it, you can't claim to be an expert. And, and I'm not trying to be mean to anybody, but most full preterists, Julian, they've not studied Christian theology um, all the way through. And I'm talking about homartiology, soteriology, ecclesiology, pneumatology, um, anthropology, and eschatology. They tried to study eschatology, but with, in the absence of all of these others, there's no real sense of the broad application of Scripture into a, th into a, a the theology, and especially systematic. Systematic theology is where you take all of what Scripture teaches on a subject and put that together and... and do this comprehensive understanding of what that teaches. And 
if you have not understand it, you're going to make the mistakes that Julian Chambers is, is making all the way through. And her first one here is, I said, and, and here's the issue. And I'll, again, I'll base this here at the beginning. When Jesus died, he went into Hades, preached the good news. What was the good news? That their sins were paid for, that they, the ransom had been paid, the price had been paid. Why is it the saints did not go to heaven? Why were they in, in Hades to begin with? And because the price for sin had to be paid first. Therefore, they were being held captive by sin and death in Hades. Hades, Sheol, was a place of, of, of waiting. But when Christ died on the cross, he paid for the forgiveness of all the saints, of those who believed, those who, who trusted in, you know, into God's righteousness of delivering them from that. So he paid the ransom price. They're set free. They're going to be set free. There is no reason for why those people in Hades have to stay there, even for 40 more years. If the ransom is paid, he say came to set them free. Do we all know that passage that he came to set the captives free, to, to bring deliverance to the prisoners? And so who were the captives? Who were the pr prisoners? So I went to Ephesians 4, 8, where it says he led, when Christ ascended, he led a host of captive captives into heaven with them and gave gifts to men. Well, the gifts he gave to men, they explained are the apostles, prophets, leaders of the church. He ascended, so he gave leadership to the church. And when he ascended, he gave captives captive. Now, she, Julian accused me of being, uh, assuming something. But I'll bring it up, and because it was mentioned in some of the things that she brought up, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But, for example, when Abraham uh, went to go rescue Lot, Lot had been taken captive by foreign enemies, all the took all their goods, the, their slaves and everything. Everything was taken captive. So Abraham got his men together, went after them, and delivered them. He set those captives free. Now those captives became his captives because he risked his life for them. So they owed him their lives. So those captives became his captives. And that way when he went back to the cities, uh, to Salem, and then to Sodom, uh, Salem he gave 10%, but to Sodom he did not. Uh, why? Uh, he, offered, he said, no, you can take all the things. Take all the slaves, everything that were yours, take. Because I don't want you to sit there and say that you made Abraham rich. Or that somehow we're in cahoots together with all of this kind of things. Um, so he, he gave them back because they belong to him now. He's the one that had the power of life and death over them. So he said, no, you can take them back. The king didn't demand them back. He said, oh, you can keep them. I'm not going to, you know, no, 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 no. It was because Abraham, they owed Abraham their lives. So that is where the phrase captive, captives come from. Again, it's quoted in Isaiah 68 in a sense that that passage there, as we know. But the idea is, is then that, like I said, the theology is that when Christ ascended into heaven in 33 A.D., at that point, uh, we would say the harrowing of Hades. The idea is, is that he went down to Hades, set those captives free, and led them into heaven. That's what he did for the three days. He led those souls into heaven because he set them free. Um, that is not resurrection. Coming out of Hades into heaven is not resurrection. Resurrection is always souls coming back into the uh, not coming out of Hades, the souls coming into the bodies and then the body, dead body standing and rising again. That's what we've argued with. Um, if um, first Thessalonians 4, let me let me show you that right there. So the scenario is this um, absolutely plain as day. So those Old Testament saints were freed, the captives were set free from Hades in 33. They ascended into heaven. Christ then ascended into heaven. Uh, they are bodiless. That is why he says David's grave is still with us today, because David has not 
been resurrected. He has not ascended, resurrected into heaven. That's the theology that they're talking about. He has not been resurrected. Jesus was resurrected, but David was not resurrected. So it, it specifically says that he's still in the tomb. That means his body. But David himself, the spirit, is in heaven. Now, when Christ returns, what does it say in First Thessalonians 4? The dead in Christ will rise first. Well, who are the dead in Christ? Well, those are Christians who have died physically. They have fallen asleep. There is no such thing as soul sleep. Sorry to say that. People, when they die, the Old Testament saints, you're going to say they went into heaven and then they went to sleep? The bodies are the ones that are asleep in the grave. And that's what Jesus talked about with Lazarus. Lazarus has fallen asleep. Oh, well, we'll just go and wake him up. No, no, no. I, I meant he's died. His body is dead. It's being, it's buried. His spirit is not there in his body anymore. That's what death is. Separation of body from spirit. And we're going to go raise him up. That means we're going to have the body come out. Resurrection of the dead. The standing again of a lifeless corpse. Always it means the same thing. So now when Jesus returns, all those people are in heaven. Are they not? Okay, let's look at a couple of scriptures. The first one. We don't want you to be informed, brothers, about those who are asleep, fall asleep, which means they are physically dead, that you may not grieve as others who do not have no hope. So it doesn't, you're not grieving because they're dead and they're staying there. We have a different hope, right? We believe that Jesus died and rose again. There's our hope. Why? Because Jesus died and rose again. Even so, us here, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. God will bring with them those who have physically died in Christ. For this is what we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left, at until or until the coming of the Lord, will not go before or proceed those who have physically died. We don't go before he did. When Christ returns, Ampantesis and Rapizo, we will meet him in the air, right? Uh, those who have fallen asleep. So those who have fallen asleep, he will bring with them. When Jesus starts coming, he brings them what ha down with them. And what happens to those dead? Those that were dead in Christ. They are made alive. They rise from the dead. <coughs> For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of Mark Andrew, with the sound of the trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive or left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, here's the idea of, uh, about the meaning. When Jesus was going into Jerusalem, what did he say? Um, he told the disciples, what? Go ahead, give warning, let them know, bring me out the cult and all of that. Let everybody, I'm coming. So, as he comes into the city, word goes forth that he's coming. The people come out and they, what do they do? They ampontesis. They meet him on there. And where is Jesus going? He is going into Jerusalem. So they go with them. Uh, and the dead will rise first. The, we who are alive, who are left, are caught together with them to meet him in the air as he's coming down to earth. And so we will always be there with the Lord. Um, the second word, caught up, rapizo, it means to be snatched up. We who are alive, who are standing or walking, we're going to be snatched up. Now, this is the same word that was used um, when Philip was talking with the Ethiopian eunuch. He was there one second, and next door, he was caught up. He was taken out. He was snatched up. He was taken away. It doesn't say where, when, or anything else. It just says this is the action of he was taken away. One minute he was there, the next minute he was taken out. Here in this contest, when Christ is coming, we're being taken out of this earth changed, made immortal and imperishable, we meet him as he's coming down. We are caught up to meet him in the air as we come down. So this is not the rapture according to dispensationalists. There, that kind of idea is bogus. We're being caught up to meet him as he's coming back down to earth. Um, and so it's those dead people who will rise first. Why are they rising first? 
God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep. Now, let's go to Revelations. And I know I've touched on this before. But for Julian's sake, I've got to give you a more of a complete theology. So she kind of can kind of grasp everything. All right. Um, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Great multitude like the roar of many waters, like the sound of many peals, the sun of crying. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt, give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself. It was granted for her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So, God brings with him the saints, right? Let me pause this for one second. I find something. Okay, go to Revelation 7. After this I looked, a great multitude nobody could number. Crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. So these are people that are, are alive, not sleeping. And all the angels standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne. Because I said, behold, a great multitude that no one can know from every nation. So these aren't angels. They're saying, blessed, they're speaking, they're not asleep. Uh, then one of the elders asked me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where do they come? And I said, Sir, you know them. They said, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. These are the saints. They have washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, serving day and night in the temple. Uh, they will hunger no more, thirst no more, uh, nor heat. The Lamb in the midst will be their shepherd. He will guide them in springs of living water, and guide God will guide that or wipe every tear away from their eyes, right? Um, go a little bit further again. We're going amount of troops. I'm looking for one other passage. I think seventh trumpet. Um, For I've taken great power, the nations raged, all of that that goes on. Hold on, let me look at real quick. Okay, let me point this out again here. Revelations 13. Uh, authority was given over to every tribe, people, language, and nation, those who dwell on the earth, everyone whose name has not been written by the foundation of the world, the book of life, the Lamb, who is slain. They, the beast is given authority over the quote-unquote church, the people. Right? And he persecutes them. Well, what was the beast actually persecuting in, in the 70 AD war? Jews, not the, later on it came to the saints, yes, by, in 54. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity goes. Captives, captives. There's, there's that kind of a, a phrase there. Um, it was allowed to give breath to the image, the image of the beast, and all causes all, both small and great, and rich poor to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. No one can buy or sell who has the mark. So that's who the beast is, and he's going to persecute and kill people. Um, this is the call for the endurance of the saints who keep the commandments of God. So we're going through that. Uh, Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. So they're in heaven. So the church is going to go through that. Now, the sharp sickle, the grapes of wrath, that is always on the ungodly, not the earth. Then the angel came out, temple, and behold, sharp sickle, put it in, gathered the from the vine. So they swung through it in the wine press. The wine press travels outside the city. The blood flowed in the wine press as high as the horse's bridle. Verse 6, seven. so it's given a real description of a battle that takes place. Um, and destruction that happens and people are killed. Seventh bowl, the great city was split in three parts. Uh, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remember battle on the great to make her drain the cup of the wine over the fury of his wrath. And so Babylon on the great. You're, 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 no. Um, December before the battle of the great day. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. So here's a clue right there. From there, demonic spirits from God, God brought to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. Okay, where did they assemble? Why were they assembling? Not Jerusalem. This time that they assembled to come against the people of God. Uh, and it is against Jerusalem, but there's no siege going on. Why? And I'll explain it. Become like a thief. There's your second coming. Um... 
yeah, be ready, guys, because this is that's as close as we're going to get to win. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The hills are uh, Megiddo. It's where they gathered. And so we go to Revelations 19. The city falls and all that. But here again, the fine linen of the righteous deeds of the saints. They're the ones who have made the bride. They're the ones that are before. Um, and those are the ones where the marriage supper happens. Why is, what is that? Well, here we go. He is clothed in red blood. The armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following on white horses. So you have the bride, the church, the ones were, uh, wearing white, fine linen, bright and pure, the deeds of the saints. Uh, they are the ones, white and pure, following him on horses. So that means they had to have been in heaven in order to come with him. The marriage supper is the resurrection that takes place. We meet him in the air. Um, and so we come with him as he comes out of heaven. Sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. So this is literally on earth. On this robe and side is the name written King Kings and the Lord of Lords. And to, and to think that people say, oh, they're not going to see that. That's an all invisible kind of a thing. I'm sorry, folks. It's just, no, he's the King of Kings and the whole world's going to know it. I saw an angel standing, loud voice, birds come together. Eat the flesh of captains, flesh of mighty men, flesh of horses, and the riders of both free and slaves, small and great. And these were the other kings of the... These were not Jewish captains, men, mighty men, horses and riders, and all of that. Nope. I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who is sitting on the horse and against his army. Not Jerusalem. And the beast was captured, the false prophet, presence done in signs by which were deceived. Those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped him. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire. The rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth. Who won the victory there of a real battle? Jesus and his armies. Um, so there, there's, your, there's basically your, your whole scenario of what uh, the pre-mill position holds to. And so when I'm talking about when he comes, the resurrection takes place. The saints are in heaven and they come with him back down. So this Matthew 27 reference, is, she's making it sound like um, those were the sons. They had to come out of Hades, go into those bodies, and then they got ascended? No. Like I said, the theology is, is they went from Hades into heaven bodiless. Uh, bodies that had died came to life, but this was not a resurrection. Yes, that was a resurrection. Now she's finally admitting that was of the resurrection. Well, gee, if that's what you call a resurrection, then in 8070 you say a resurrection took place, then why didn't the bodies come out and everybody see? Imagine, Christ said to all the Christians, when Christ comes, the dead in Christ will rise. It doesn't mean just the saints of Jerusalem or in Ephesus. It means every saint across the whole Roman Empire, across the whole land, would have been raised, stood up out of their graves, and walked around and would have been seen. And then caught up to meet the Lord in the air. As he comes down, they become his armies and would have kicked the Roman air. But, what? See, you see the contradiction there, uh, as Don likes to say. You see the train coming. You can't have Jesus coming with all of his saints to defeat the armies. And then yet the Roman army was sent by God to destroy Jerusalem in judgment. That's what places it at two different times. That's why it cannot be the second coming. That's why your interpretation of Revela uh, Revelations 19 is inconsistent, incoherent, and not logical. Because Christ gets the victory. Uh, let me point out one more thing here. I'm going to add to it. You can go back and look at it. This is called exegesis, not eisegesis. It's based on years of study. Um, the hot the city go into exile. Zechariah 14. Cut off from the city. Okay, that's 70 AD. Then the Lord will go fight against nations. That's when he fights on the day of battle. He goes out to fight against the nations. Not Jerusalem. Not, not Jerusalem. He's not going to fight against Jerusalem. He's going out to fight against the nations that came against Jerusalem. I, I, 
This is about as more common sense as you can you can be. And on that day when he does that, he comes out to fight. And on that day, his feet shall stand in the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. He returns to Jerusalem. Acts 1-2, this same Jesus you saw will return in the same way from out of heaven back to earth. And he comes with his saints. Nobody said that he was describing that in every detail in Acts 1. Or that it could not happen. All he was talking about is that Jesus will come back. He's in heaven. He'll come back to earth. That's all it says. Then the Lord my God will come. And when he comes, what? And all the holy ones with him. First, second, first Thessalonians 3, 13. Let's go there real quick. I'm going to do it. First Thessalonians 3. Uh, name me God, my Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, direct our way. May the Lord increase and bound in love for you, so that he may establish you in your hearts in blameless, in holiness, before our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus, with all his saints. So it's not just Jesus himself who comes down. It is all the saints, the dead in Christ, all of them, that will return with him those people who were killed in the tribute, they are the ones who are coming back as his army with all of his saints. I hope you're listening to this. Um, uh, he was dead for four days when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. His body came to life. Thank you. Now you're admitting that is what resurrection of the dead is. Bodies coming back to life. But he was not raised to life eternal in his spiritual body. The ear got that right. The resurrection of the righteous to life eternal was to take place on the last day at the time of the great distress foretold in Daniel 12. I can argue, I'm not going to go into Daniel 12, why it doesn't say that. But again, the whole point is the whole church, there's nobody in the church that ever said in the first century, second century, or third century, there is not one person who ever said that a resurrection took place in 70 AD or a spiritual resurrection ever took place so that there was any kind of fulfillment of any of that in 70 AD or his second coming. There is no record of it, didn't do it, and you have to assume that the whole church is completely stupid for somebody to sit there and claim, oh, it did happen, but they were just too dumb to know. Sorry. Uh you believe the holy people ascended into heaven with Jesus. This is conjecture. See, and that's why. Why is it conjecture? There's the scripture. He's in 4 8. He led captives to them. Um, I told you about he meet them in the air. When the Lord comes down, he will meet them, all right? But you also believe the holy people ascended to heaven as in disembodied souls without their bodies, right? Yes, when they died. But we're talking about Hades, when Hades was empty. So everybody who dies from now on, who is in Christ, why would they have to go to Hades? Why would they be a captive to sin and death again, and to captives of Satan, who held the keys to death and life and all that, and it was Jesus who took them back? So why would Jesus leave them in Hades? Or after they died, why would they have to go to Hades? No, no, no logical reason there. Only the unsaved are the ones going to Hades. Being, um, so I believe the holy people ascended to heaven with Jesus in those three days that he was in the ground. But you also believe the holy people ascended to heaven as disembodied souls at that time. Without them. So what happened to the dead bodies that came to life? If these ascended to heaven as naked souls, when and why did they discard their bodies? And see, she again is correlating the emptying of Hades with his death and resurrection that time, with Matthew 27, 52. And I'm saying, you can't. We're not saying that is the resurrection, um, because coming out of Hades is not a resurrection. They did not come out of Hades, go into all their bodies, all over the whole entire Roman arm uh, land and everything else, and every Christian stand up and rise. See, that's the distinction. We're not talking about the general drift. If he ascended, and people were raised, that's not the general uh, resurrection because the general resurrection happens when he comes back a second time. So you would have to argue this would be part of the first fruits. And again, did they go into heaven? Very possible. We don't know. We have no clue about that. The Bible does not say. 
Uh, death is the severance of body and soul, of course, as the bodies of the holy people came to life when Jesus died in Matthew 20. But they ascended to heaven without their bodies. Nobody said that. They died twice. And But yet you want to claim that Jesus doesn't have a body in heaven, and so he died twice. <laughs> doesn't work, right? And if they were Jesus in heaven as bodiless souls, they are in the grip of death. The body is always described as being in the grip of death because it's dead and in a grave. The soul or the spirit of the person is alive in heaven where they can talk, think, the whole nine yards. Um, alternative, if they ascended into heaven bodily since they appeared in the holy city and were invisible to mortal eyes. Who witnessed their ascension? That's just point. The Bible doesn't talk, so who witnessed their ascension? Nobody. So... We would assume that there was no ascension. Duh. There was no bodily ascension. If there was, they would have possibly seen it. Same thing goes true for 70 AD. If nobody saw a bodily resurrection or an ascension of the saints into heaven, then it did not happen. Uh, souls going to heaven is not a resurrection. So whenever I did, I say it was. At the resurrection to life eternal, the dead ones are raised in spiritual bodies. Uh, she has never accepted the fact that spiritual bodies does not mean a body that's already in heaven that's made spiritual. The spiritual body always means and refers to the dead body that was in the grave is being raised, changed. It is going to be made uh, perishable to imperishable, dishonorable to honorable, glorious. Um, it'll become immortal. All the things. It is a glorified body. Um Philippians 3.21, he, he will take and transform this lowly natural body and change it to be like his glorious body. We're going to become like that in the, in the resurrection. Um, the thing is this, the resurrection of Lazarus was not a resurrection to life, eternal because he was raised in the safe cell, cell same body. Nobody's arguing, but eternal life is about the soul, not the body. Resurrection is about the eternal state of the body after it's been raised. And when the term of his natural life ended, he died. His resurrection was a sign that brought glory to Jesus. Yes. Likewise, the moment Jesus died, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Their mortal bodies were dead. Okay. A mortal means subject to death. So their mortal bodies were dead. They lived, yes, so they came back just like Lazarus. This was not a resurrection of life everlasting because the time of the resurrection was future. Thank you very much. Yes, and it was all future. This, this. So this is either the first fruits or what? Um, Jesus was the first fruit of the resurrection. He was raised to life, never to die again on the third day. No one was raised bodily to life eternal or prior to his resurrection. I agree. Nobody said he was. But you're assuming that I'm saying Matthew 27, 52 was. There's the problem in your thinking. Nobody said Matthew 27, 52 was the harrowing of Hades. Um, if the bodies raised were not spiritual bodies, the resurrection was a sign. Jesus died, the temple curtain tore, and the bodies of many holy people who died came to life. In his, in his sacrificial death, Jesus conquered the grave. He was the resurrection of life, and at the time appointed by the Father, multitudes who slept in the dust of the earth would awake. There you go. Multitudes who slept in the earth would awake. Some to everlasting, and others to shame and everlasting come to eh, boop. Sorry. This whole idea, uh, I'm, I'm going to do it real quick. I'm going to do it real quick. Um, so that you can see the connections here. Of exegesis, not eisegesis, like what... Uh, you see many times. Isaiah 26. I might have to do the Daniel 12 thing just for the sake here. 26, uh, 19. Your dead shall live. Their bodies, the dead bodies, the corpses shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for good. For your dew is the dew of light. And the earth will give birth to the dead. The earth will give birth to those people. They will come back to life. There's, There it is, right? Okay. Go to Daniel. 
Whoops, Daniel 12, not 2. Now look at it. At that time shall Michael, the great prince, has changed of your people. There shall be time of trouble such as never seen since there was a nation of day. But at that time your people shall be delivered. So at that time Israel will be delivered. When was Israel delivered in 70 AD? It wasn't, was it? And everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. So that's Christians, right? Everybody's name found in the room. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. That's what we got. Okay, this is resurrection, right? Those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to after their lives and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. When? When? Uh, at the end, when the people shall be delivered. But at that time, your people, Israel, shall be delivered. When will Israel be delivered? When will they be delivered? Zechariah 14. Um, the Lord will be king over the earth, and on the day the Lord will be one in his name. And that's over the earth, not in heaven, over the earth. He will become the one who will rule over the whole earth. With the rod, Jerusalem shall remain aloft and saved from the gates. There will be this greater, but Jerusalem will remain, and it shall be inhabited, and there will never again be an utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. When did Jerusalem dwell in security after seventy A.D.? It hasn't. On the day that he comes, it will dwell. Now, what happens then? Everyone who then survives of the nation that came against Jerusalem shall go up year after year and worship the king, the Lord of hosts, in the face of Booth. There you go. Those armies are defeated, the ones that gather in the Valley of Megiddo. Zechariah 12. Uh, then the clans of Jews shall say to themselves, The inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through the Lord, their Lord of hosts, their God. On that day I will make clans of Judah like blazing pots, set everybody on fire, right? while Jerusalem shall again be abandoned in its place in Jerusalem. And on that day, the Lord will what? Protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that the people among them will be on a day like the day David in the house of David like that, right? And then go back to 14th real quick. Then everyone who survives the nation that came against Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, the king. See, if we're resurrected to be with him forever, then we will rule the nations with the uh, over. We will rule and reign with him. He will rule over the nations with the rod of iron. We will rule and reign with him over the earth. Hence, pre mill, um, historic pre mill. Now, that is what I'm hoping is sinking through. Uh, so they were not spiritual bodies. So after the resurrection of Jesus, the people raised to life appeared in the holy city, disembodied souls. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it is reason to remind that these people have recently died and were known. But if this was a sign, what did the holy people, why did the holy people, to, to, show, to show what resurrection is? Because at the resurrection of the dead, the righteous would appear with Jesus. No, 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 no. See, appear with Jesus where he is in heaven. Uh, Jesus comes down out of heaven and he appears here on earth and we are raised to meet him in the air and he comes back and he rules over this thing. See, she argues that the appearing is in heaven, not here on earth. Uh, he comes down out of heaven to this earth and raises the dead. Uh, would appear with Jesus where he is? No, see, he comes out of heaven. Acts 1, he comes out of him from heaven to earth. Julian, that's what you don't get. He's not appearing up in heaven. He's appearing down here on earth with his saints. That's a major faux pas of yours. When the epistle of the New Testament was written, the dead in Christ were sleeping. No such thing as sleeping. Uh, and therefore the fulfillment of dead to his future. Oh, so let's point out something else. So yeah, we know it's future. And what does John why, what does John 5 say about this? I'm not going to commentaries. Picked the wrong one here, but hey, we can do this. John 5. Uh, 
For, he, the, for as the Father has life in himself, so is he granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment. Because he is the Son of Man, Daniel 7.13, because he is the Son of Man, he ascended, he executes judgment. So do not marvel this, for an hour is coming, a time is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. They will have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So there is an hour. When is this hour? When is this time of when this resurrection takes place of the just and not just? Well, First Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 says, when Christ comes, there is only a resurrection of the dead in Christ, not the unjust, only the just, correct? So go to Revelations 20. What is going on here? Um, I saw the thrones who were committed authority, and I saw the souls who had been beheaded for the testament. Those who had not worshipped, they came to life. They were resurrected. So he comes. They come to life and they reign with Christ for a thousand years on earth because they came to life. The rest of the dead, this is the dead in Christ, only the dead in Christ are raised. The rest of the dead did not come to life until after the thousand years was ended. So this is the first resurrection, those coming to life of those people. That's where everybody has a major faux pas problem with it. So it's not the same hour. It, the idea is, is each has their own hour. Each has their own time when it will happen, according to Daniel. And so when we go back to Daniel real quick, let's finish that out real fast on something. It says what? Um, the time shall rise great, but at that time your people will be delivered. So at the time his people are delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. So is Daniel's name written in the book? Yeah, you bet. So what will happen on that day when everybody whose name in the book were going to be delivered at the time? Many of those who sleep in this will awake. And those who are, are wives shall shine like the brightness. Of God. And those who turn many right to them and the stars forever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time that many shall run to and fro in knowledge shall increase. You, Daniel, shut the words of the book and seal it up until the time of that end. What was the time of the end? At the time when your people are delivered and everyone's name shall be found written in the book will do what? Be resurrected. What did Martha say to Lazarus? I know that he will rise on the last day. What is the last day? The day of the resurrection. That is the last day. Um, so Daniel looked and the others and stood on the bank. Someone said to me, how long shall it be then to the end of these wonders? Well, what wonders? All the things that he said there. All the things that have gone there. Um, how long shall it be? And I've heard that the man clothed the linen was above in the water stream and raised his right hand for a time, time and a half, and that when the shattering of the power of the Holy Spirit comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I didn't understand. So all what things? All the things that he's talking about. Go back. Uh, Darius me, all the prophecies going on through there. The time of the end, the king of the south shall attack. He shall pitch his palatial tents to see the glorious mount. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. So this is the prophecy of historical things that are going on. He shall come to his glorious land. Tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand. Edom and Moab. Um, and shall become rulers of the treasure of gold and silver, precious things of Egypt, Belishian, Cushite, from the east and west. So this is all talking about something that happened before 70 AD. And at that time, at the time of what? At the time of the end. I hate these thing divisions. What? You shall come to his end with none to help him. So at the time of the end, at that time, shall rise Michael, the great prince, who is charge of people, and there shall be a time of trouble. He's already been describing a time of trouble, right? That's what he said. Such has never been seen since there was a nation. Uh, there was a nation till that time. But at that time, at that time, your people shall be delivered. We're talking about this past time. We're talking about all those things that have been prophesied in through there. His people are going to be delivered. Eh, 70 AD was not. I mean, there was a resonance, that, but not much, right? But everybody's name was found in the book. So this is describing a different time. 
Daniel, you're going to die. You're going to go to your place and everything else. And at the end, uh, when all this finally comes to an end, your people will be delivered. Everybody's written name in the book of life will be delivered. You'll go there. But and, and there'll be a resurrection of all these people, which will include you. And you will roll our wives. And those who are wives shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many, turn many to record like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro. So we're talking about what is talked about before. Um, so all those things are going to happen in that time frame. Everything that's described in that time frame is going to happen. But it does not say that at the time your people will be delivered. Do you get that? That's not 70 A.D. That's not when his people were delivered. That's a different time. And it's at that time, after that time, when the resurrection takes place. At the end of time, with all the names written in the book of life, that's when it takes place. At the end of time. Um, so when the epistles of the New Testament were written, the dead Christ were sleeping. There, yeah, No, it never says they were sleeping. And therefore, the fulfillment of Daniel was future. There was no eternal city. <laughs> Believers were waiting for the city that is to come. Postscript, you said 33 AD. I think it was 38 AD. Yeah, I got that little argument. I wanted to see how inane Bill Dalek is. And he's going to argue about the stupidity of a dating one, two, three, whatever. You, you know, some people say, oh, he's born two. Some born three. Actually, 30 AD is actually 33 AD. It's not really 30 AD. I mean, there's a whole host of stupidity of arguments that are mean, that are oh so insane. Because the problem is nobody knows the exact day when Jesus was born. But everybody is saying, how do we count? This is 2024 years after what? After the birth of Christ. So the birth of Christ becomes the beginning point. He walked this earth for 30 years. His ministry was 33 and he died. I, I, I don't care if you think it was 2 AD, 2 BC, 4 BC, or what the hell. It's just an asinine argument in the same way that you would argue about how many angels fit in the head of a pen. And I played into that and watched how far, far Bill Dollop would go with the whole stupid thing. And it just, uh, unbelievable. Um, okay, so I made a big answer there to her Bill Dalek did his thing about the dating and then Julian came back you have made a huge assumption namely that there the verse Ephesians 4 8 when he sent it upon high he let captives captive he gave gifts to men and when the transition bodily souls came out of Hades into the presence of Christ in heaven see was the transition of body souls out of Hades into the presence of Christ in heaven um uh, that's what I said. According to Ellicott. Now, Ellicott, Barnes, and these people she puts, uh, I, I, I started to write this up. Let me see if I can find this real quick. Um, let me show you something here real quick. I, I will be putting this up there. She's talking about Ellicott, 1819 to 1905. Barnes, 1798 to 1870. Gill, 1697 to 1771. That's what she likes from scholars for three. And how did they write? What did they write? Um, she's never going to grasp the point. Different scholars have different ideas and opinions. That's always going to happen. Nobody means it's right. Then you're quoting from scholars from 100 years or older. And here's the idea. That here's here's the the contradiction, the hypocrisy, I don't know, however you want to call it, Julian. You're quoting from these about an interpretation of the scripture. And yet every one of these people defended the bodily resurrection and a future resurrection and a future second coming. They all did it. They all used scripture to prove it. But yet you say they were all wrong about those facts. But yet you want to bring them up and say they were all right about this and I believe what they said about this and so what happens is you pick and choose scholars and what they say according to your subjective knowledge like I said at the beginning you don't have a systematic theology you don't understand how it works and so you don't you make these kind of mistakes you 
oh, these people were right here, here. Oh, no, they were dead wrong here, here. Well, what made them wrong or what made them right? And see, the ability to be able to explain why they're wrong or why they are right is outside of your purview of comprehension because you don't know systematic theology. I'm sorry. I, I just terrible. You put in there... Um, he led captivity, captives describe our Lord's triumph over the power of evil. It's here probably best in Puritan Colossians to be when it is said of the principles and powers, the powers of sin and death, that he may show them openly triumphing over them in the cross. How did he show triumph over them? His resurrection, his physical bodily resurrection. Did he triumph over the power of evil? Yes. He was given the keys of the kingdom. And how did he prove that? He was raised from out of the death. Death could not hold him. So his physical resurrection is the power of him having over the principalities. He's got power over that now, all authority over that. So why does that, why does that not include the captives that were in Hades that he would not have the power to raise them out of that? He led captive to captive. The meaning of this in Psalms 1 is that he triumphed over his foes. Yes. It's the language derived from a conqueror who not only makes captives, but who makes captives of those who were then prisoners. Were they prisoners of Hades? Yes. The power of sin and death was being held over. They were prisoners. And who conducts them as part of his triumphal procession? Christ. Because he took them out, he triumphed. Into, so the, the, the image there, <coughs> again, when a Roman king uh, was coming to a city. I'm going to bring up two words here. When a Roman king came to a city they hadn't been to before, this was his parousia, in part, because he was coming after being absent. Now, he is coming to the city, and he's being presented to him there. Correct? Secondly, when a king came in triumph back to Rome, he led a procession of, of the captives in front of him. All of his captives are put in front of them to show up. The people would get word that the Roman general is coming. People would empty out of the city, meet him on the road, and they would go in in celebration. Go to Rome. You have the uh, Titus, the Arch of Titus, and their victory over the Jews, the Jewish wars in 70 AD. You know, you got this monument about that. And that's exactly what happened. They led a procession. So they're using this real life thing as an analogy of to what Christ would do. Um, triumph for procession. He led the captives captive. He not only subdues his end, but he leads his captives in triumph. The allusion is to the public triumph of conquerors, especially celebrating among the Romans in which captives were led in chains, and to the custom in such triumphs of distributing presents among the soldiers. So he's taking it and he's adapting it. Christ is leading the captives, captives free into heaven. And when he leaves, he's leaving gifts to men. What is that? Apostles, prophets. That's what, uh, sh shoot, let me uh, go back there. Is that, uh, no, that's not it. Whoops. Did I go to the, I'm going to the wrong one. Uh, right here. Um, what was I saying? I got myself mixed up here. Uh, the progression, going into heaven. So when he came down, that's everything that went. Uh, <coughs> I forgot where I was going. So he triumphed over all his foes. He ascended in heaven. He triumphed over all his foes. It was completely victory over the malice of the great enemy of God and over those who sought his life. So triumph. They saw him ascending in heaven. Uh, complete victory. And then Barnes adds in here what? But he did more. He rescued those who were the captives of Satan. Well, who are the captives of Satan? Did he automatically rescue all the Jews? No. Pharisees? No. Who's he talking about here in this passage, Barnes? The captives of Satan are those in Hades. He led them in triumph. 
Man was held by Satan as a prisoner. Yes, in Hades, his chains were around him. Christ rescued the captive prisoner and designed to make him a part of his triumphal procession into heaven, that thus the victory might be complete, triumphing not only over the great foe himself, but swelling his possession with the attending host of those who had been the captives of Satan is now rescued. He's saying the exact same thing that I did. Julian looks at that and spiritualizes it. She can't see the correlation between the reality and the literal. Especially when you're told into the idea that nobody ascended into heaven until 70 A.D. How can God bring with them those saints that they weren't already up there? Um, so I believe this was fully realized at the Parousia when the Son of Man came in his Father's glory and the saints escorted Jesus into the holy city. And the saints escorted. See this? Okay, how the saints? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, see, if that was the Parousia, yes, but AD 70 was not the Parousia. It was not the second coming. So according to Paul, the dead in Christ were sleeping. No, they were in hell, Hades, when the epistles of the New Testament were written and the resurrection from the dead was future, he writes. So according to Paul, the dead in Christ were sleeping. Uh, wow. For the Lord will come down from heaven with the house, and now he reads the whole thing, but she only picks up one. She doesn't get the, that other part. Yeah, God will bring with him. She misses that part. And then she goes on to Gil's thing and everything else. So it's basically the same thing. In which captives were led into chains and exposed to open view. It's the same thing. The the captives. Who are the captives? She spiritualizes it. I'm telling you. It's the saints that were in Hades. You assume when he said in a high led captivity captive to mean that when Jesus said to heaven, he led a host of captives who ascended into heaven with him. Yes. However, according to the scripture, Jesus ascended to heaven alone. <laughs> so that's the problem. I never said that's when he ascended, um, when those saints ascended. He was in the grave for three days. He took that those saints in Hades and to a procession into heaven. He gone up, went there, delivered him, and then we're talking about his soul could be holding in Hades. Where would it be otherwise? In Hades. Some, yeah, full press think that he had to go to Hades and be a captive, had to suffer in Hades and all of that. To pay the price for sin. Um, and then was released. And that's completely bogus. But the idea is, is that he set those captives free. Led them in a procession into heaven. And then he himself is raised and resurrected. When he is raised and resurrected. The power of that resurrection. Uh, goes to others that were also recently dead. And they are raised. And uh, come back to life. And they are seen by many. Um. So, yes, he ascended alone. Nobody ever said anything. That was the first first fruits or anything like that. What's more, why were believers eagerly waiting for adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, if they were to reign with Christ in heaven as in disembodied souls for 2,000 years? Because the ruling and the reigning is on earth, like I showed you. It's over the nations. It's not in heaven. There's no reason for saints to rule over the nations in heaven. That, that, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, why would Christians rule over other Christians? Because there's only Christians in heaven. Uh, even now. So there's Christians in heaven. After 78, she believes that they're all there. So all up there. So are you telling me the saints up there are ruling over each other right now and telling, <laughs> ruling over there with a rod of... See, it, it doesn't make any coherent sense. The ruling and reigning is on earth. When he rules the nations with the right we will rule and reign with him on earth. Uh, so this is why I keep saying it just, it just, it's just crazy. It's just absolutely crazy, this argument. All right, I've gone on for another hour. Have I? Yep, exactly an hour right now over this whole thing. I hope she listens. I hope people listen and, and, and pay attention to what I'm saying and and, and kind of grasp it. Um, and that's my original video and all that. All right, guys, thanks for putting up with me again. Pass this on. I hope she hears it. Your guess is as good as mine, I guess, in one sense. But uh, we'll see you later.